So there are three main functions of a curtain wall. It's the outer skin of your building. It's not a structural element per se in that it's not what is supporting your building or shouldn't be what is supporting your building. The odd time we see a few boo-boos in that area. Um, but it does have to resist wind load, dead load, other applied forces uh, and function properly on them. Uh, it regulates the interior environment, keeps the outside out, the inside in. Here we're talking things like air, water penetration, uh, thermal regulation, daylighting, glare. Curtain walls will play a very, very key role in all of those things. And finally, architecturally, I'm assuming we have a lot of architects in the room. Um, one of the most commonly used and, and prominent features on, on many, many facades, and have been for about 40 years now in Canada, is the curtain wall. So it's very important when it's designed and, and then they will age and they will start to show their age at a certain point in their lifespan. And, and now we're finding that the architects are getting involved in that second renewal phase of the life cycle on the curtain wall. So before I jump in, I'm gonna talk really, really briefly here on how these things go together. And there are many, many different kinds. So this is one of the most simple that I have in my hand here. Uh, it's just a, a four inch deep back section, probably three and five eighths, um, captured system on my right, on your left, structurally glazed in this one. Uh, they go together, there's a spigot here, and this would get sealed at that joint, which becomes part of your air seal. So not too important there, because there's so many different ways these things can go together. What is common about them are, are the principles of, of having a drained cavity of pressure equalization, and those are the things that are, we'll talk about. It doesn't really matter what kind of curtain wall system, you should have those things. So what those are, a, a dual seal system. There's both a, a, an outer seal in the case of the captured system. It's the uh, pressure plate, and there would be a gasket or a tape between the plate and the vision unit. Uh, pressure plate, sorry, I don't have that one out here. Um, on the structurally glazed system, the structural glazing, or the silicone, actually forms your primary air seal. Your secondary would be a weather bead uh, between the panes of glass, sometimes that's a gasket as well. So these systems work on the principle that some water is going to get past your outer seal. It's almost inevitable that that one is not going to be perfect. That's okay. We have a primary air seal to stop it from coming into the building and water seal. We collect the water and we drain the water. So you have to look, when you're, uh, when you're diagnosing a curtain wall, it's very important to look at how is it supposed to collect the water, how is the water supposed to drain out of the system, and is there anything going on that is preventing that from happening. Um, pressure equalization is a concept that we talk about with curtain walls. That basically means that the temperature, or temperature, the pressure outside of the system is instantaneously equalized with the pressure between the gaskets. What we don't want is a pressure differential that could cause the system to retain water between the seals, which is likely to lead to it coming into the building. So in terms of ways these, uh, these systems can fail, uh, regulating the environment, one of the most common problems we're going to see is water leaks. Uh, this is a very severe example, a lot of water coming into the building under a, a quite a simple hose test. Uh, this isn't even a pressurized test, we're just seeing the water flood in. Uh, a lot of times when we're dealing with a problem like this, it can be relatively simple to diagnose because when, when we open that system up, there, there's likely something that we're going to be able to visually see that is causing that level of water to come in that quickly. Where it can be more difficult is that if you get a little bit of water coming in or only get water under certain atmospheric conditions that are a lot more difficult to replicate. Uh, interior environment, and thermal regulation. This is actually a picture from Toronto City Hall looking at the before and after there. Uh, the before system on the left was the original single glazing from City Hall. So about 50 years old when this picture was taken and they had applied a film to the interior of the glass. Uh, the film was meant to reflect out some of the heat in the summer. Uh, they're having a lot of trouble, especially on the upper floors of the East Tower, regulating the interior environment there. Uh, in the summer months, the temperatures would often be up in the high 20s, even up into the 30s on the upper floors there. Very, very uncomfortable to work in, a lot of glare, 
big part of the problem that they're experiencing too is that film had significantly deteriorated over the years. So some of what we're seeing there is dirt. A lot of what we're seeing though is just the film has broken down and started to crack and blister in different places. And, and at this point it's like that film is baked onto the window. There, there's no way you could remove it without actually putting a new piece of glass in there. Uh, structural failures uh, can be quite interesting and uh, quite dangerous in cases. Um, and I will say, when I'm talking about structural failures, it's not the building structure failing, it's pieces of the building coming off. Um, so I'm lumping those all into one uh, category, even though there, there is definitely a difference between them. Uh, this is a metal panel system on a building. Uh, we were up doing a, a simple investigation on there. At that point in time, the owner wasn't aware of any problems with the panels on the building. It was preventative uh, risk management type of uh, investigation. What we did find is when we were doing a, a simple pull test at the corners, some of the panels were starting to peel back. So earlier, earlier signs or stages of a failure. Uh, moving on to something a little bit more severe, uh, this is about a 45 section foot section of spandrel panel, occupied building in the GTA area, very large wind event, and most of that shifted off the wall. Uh, when this photo is taken, that is positively fastened at each jam, and it's retained at the sill. So there's very, very little holding that entire section of spandrel panel on, and if it had come down, it was mostly, most likely coming down as one piece at that point in time. Uh, so they're fortunate that uh, that's all that happened on that. Uh, what we are, or I guess more aptly, are not looking at there are the three missing panels that came from floors 35 through 37 of a 40-story tower. Uh, once again, a very large wind event uh, came in on the, uh, the, the, the day of the wind event to start cleaning up. Uh, we were working on an adjacent site uh, for the same uh, same owner, and then they said, we've got some panels missing. And when I say missing, they really did mean missing. Those uh, five by seven foot, one eighth inch aluminum panels, weigh about 50, 60 pounds each, came down from 400 feet up in the air and were never located after that. Uh, so we don't know where they ended up. And uh, luckily, we don't think they damaged anything because uh, we never heard about it anyways. So um, it made the investigation slightly more complicated, but uh, in reality, when we got into that one, and, and I talk about this one a little bit more in, in the causes of section, uh, it really was obvious what some of the problems were with this system. Uh, this is within the past month. Um, that really, really, really big windstorm we had about uh, two Tuesdays ago. A uh, piece of glass came down from a building and shattered the back windshield, cracked the front windshield. And if we look at the uh, picture on the right there, that is actually a piece of glass sticking right through the hood of the car. Um, once again, property damage, no injuries, uh, which was fortunate on that. And uh, so again, one, one of the more severe failures we've seen. Uh, architectural failures. I lump fails in the sealed units into an architectural failure on the basis that the only reason people change or owners change that glass is because they fog. If it was just the seals gone and the only consequence is there's no argon gas in there or anything, no one would ever change those. So they really are a visual impairment on the building. Uh, this particular skylight system had 80 sealed units in it and they had 80 failed sealed units in it. Um, so it's really easy to uh, pick out the bad ones. Um, sealed units should get a life of at least 20 years. That's sort of the general rule of thumb. Uh, there have been some fairly comprehensive studies. The, uh, the Manufacturers Association uh, did a long range or long term study. It was down in the States, uh, but they did look at a number of different uh, climate ranges, a uh, number of different geographic areas. Uh, tens of thousands of units were involved in the study. And what they found was that after 25 years, the failure rate was around 3%. Uh, there is a lot of caveats to that study. I can certainly refer anyone to it if they're interested in reading more on that. Uh, what, what was really interesting, though, and what the takeaway was for us, is that two of the buildings in the study contributed 
overall to about 1% of that 3% failure rate. And those two buildings had known drainage problems right from day one. So big takeaway there is that if your system isn't draining properly and if it is retaining water within the seals, it is very, very likely to have a, a negative impact on the overall lifespan of those sealed units. Another architectural uh, issue, this building is out in Edmonton, that city center place. Uh, about 25 years old when this was taken, and at that point in its life, and this was obviously not included in the study, because they had replaced about 25% of their sealed units at that point. Another 25% had failed and were scheduled for replacement. So we can see on that a lot of different colors in the vision areas. Some of what we're looking at there is just the lines being drawn or not drawn. A lot of what we're looking at though is because they've had so many units replaced over the years, you get different batches of glass in, slightly different colors on either the glass itself or the coatings that are used. And we're looking at a really, really modeled appearance on the building at this stage in its life. Uh, so the owners in that case decided rather than continuing to spend quite significant sums of money on that annual maintenance program, it would be better to take a step back, uh, evaluate the building in its entirety, and come up with a, a really comprehensive retrofit program on the entire building. So why are these systems failing? Um, usually, on the more severe failures, it's going to be some combination of those. We don't usually see one little thing cause a whole system to fail, although we will talk about a couple things at times where, where, where we have seen that. Um, so design details can be things that uh, weren't designed correctly, and we certainly see that, or weren't designed at all. And where those tend to be is in your transition areas, your one-off details that don't get the upfront engineering and architectural attention when these systems are being planned and, and constructed. Uh, construction details, similarly, things that can be done wrong in the field. Also, best practices and what was acceptable in the 70s when these were first coming out, we were learning on them, have evolved over the years, and, and, and some things we certainly have got better at. Uh, finite lifespan of components, anything exposed to the UV, to the sun, uh, finishes on materials can fade, can start to show their age, uh, gaskets, sealants will all harden, start to crack and start to fail. So at some point in the curtain walls, uh, the life of the building, the curtain wall will have a number of its components up for a fairly major overhaul in that time period. Uh, extreme weather events is something I've added in here just recently, uh, given a lot of the structural failures that we show, were on wind events that, while they might have been slightly below the, the design <laughs> pressures of these systems, in, in, in one case, and one and one that I didn't show here, was very, very close. We actually, uh, during that wind event uh, a couple weeks ago, measured the ground wind speed of 140 kilometers at a site we were working on. Um, again, that wasn't the overall prevailing winds, but the way it was coming around the building was very, very close to 150 kilometers an hour, which is what the system we had designed on that building uh, was using as those loads. So in a new system, it's probably okay. You have a factor of safety. On a 40-year-old system, though, some of that factor of safety has maybe gone away through fatigue and through wear on the components, and it might not be as robust anymore. Uh, so it is certainly something to keep in mind from a risk management standpoint. So jumping in now to uh, showing root causes of failures, uh, before I get in, I, I mean, one of the common environmental conditions we talked about was water leakage. Uh, on a very simple level, you need three conditions present for water to leak into a curtain wall or really any system. Uh, you need a hole for it to enter into, you need water, and you need a pressure differential. If you can take any one of those three things away, you will solve your leak problem. Um, that's not to say that you shouldn't try and take them all away uh, because they really uh, can do that in a curtain wall for the most part. Uh, what we're looking at here, any technical people in the audience might catch me, that's not actually a curtain wall system, but it's, uh, it is a window system and it has a very, very large hole in the corner. Uh, that gasket is the primary seal in this particular type of system and we can see about an inch gap. Um, it was kind of funny on that water test, we were out there and we walked in and 
looked at the hole in the corner and said, okay, well, there's, there's your problem. And uh, the person we were with insisted on doing a water test to show that water could come in through that hole. And we were like, oh, okay. So they flooded the place and uh, uh, we cleaned up after them. But uh, when you see stuff like that, yeah, there's definitely that's got to be fixed. Maybe there's something else in there, but a water test isn't going to show that. It's just going to come in the easiest place, path of least resistance. Uh, this is kind of the perfect curtain wall photo for demonstrating all the stupid stuff that you can do on a uh, very small area. Um, start with the hole in the system that we're looking at, uh, the gaskets in the corner. So it, just for a little bit of context, the vision unit has been removed here. Pressure plates and caps are off. This is a four-sided captured system. Uh, so it's a dry interior. The gasket that we're seeing there with the hole in it is part of your primary air and water seal. Uh, so a couple things. Uh, generally speaking at the sills, we like to see the verticals go straight through and the horizontals butt up to the verticals. It's a little bit better from a drainage standpoint. Uh, second, those gaskets need to be cut long. Uh, they will shrink and, and there are specifications when you're installing these systems on how much Lang extra length you have to include when you're cutting them to allow for the natural shrinkage of the gasket. Uh, they come in a roll, that's part of the reason. So you always want to unroll it, let it sit, and then cut it. <coughs> uh, that corner should be sealed. Uh, even on a dry system, it's best practice to have a little bit of sealant at the, at the corners in case you do get some shrinkage. Uh, and then compounding the problem, uh, what we speculate happened, and the fairly high degree of probability in this case is that the system was leaking in the corners, which is where the hole is. Uh, someone with not a lot of familiarity, familiarity with these types of systems went out to remediate that, and the best they could come up with was take a caulking gun and gob a bunch of caulking in the corner where it's leaking. Seems logical. What they've actually done, though, is exasperate their problem because now we have a blockage in the corner, which is where that system is supposed to be draining. Any water is coming down the jams, it's supposed to drain out the sill through the weepers in your pressure plates and snap caps. Uh, having that impediment to drainage is actually making it more likely that we gather water at the exact wrong spot because it's right where our hole is. This is much more like what that should look like. Uh, you can see the gaskets going straight through on the verticals. We can see a little bit of sealant at the corner with the gaskets. Corner block is in and it's well tooled. So it's not going to block the drainage path when that, ga or when that uh, vision glass goes in. Uh, next one, this was about a seven year old building when we looked at it. Uh, from day one, it had leaked. Uh, and the reasons were fairly simple. We can see in this area, we've got a vision unit removed, a spandrel glass removed. I'm gonna zoom in on the corner of the back pan there. And what we found is the contractor didn't use sealant. And when I mean didn't use sealant, it's not just that they didn't use sealant around the back pans, they just didn't use sealant on this job. So anywhere that should have had a wet seal, this was a stick built system on site, uh, anywhere that should have had a wet seal, there was just none in existence. So around the perimeters of the back pans, they didn't see, seal the joints in the system when they were putting it together. Uh, so it was basically just metal on metal throughout. Uh, that hole that we're looking at there goes right into interior space and uh, that's letting basically the outside into the building at any point throughout the year, anytime you have a bit of a pressure differential or a, or a temperature difference. And again, just mentioning that uh, 440 tape that we're looking at, which would be equivalent to this spot on the, on the mullion, very, very critical that that gets installed during construction, that those are not put together dry. Uh, you'll never get a seal from metal on metal uh, without sealant applied. Um, and that is actually a fairly common problem that we run into. That simple detail, this isn't done when these things are being built. Um, and that's a difficult one to retrofit because if the seal isn't there, really the best you can do is skim over top of it, which is likelier to fail. And then you have a lot of trouble in places like this where it transact, transition between the mullions. 
uh, if you have a quarter inch glazing adapter, those can be really tricky areas to get at in the field and rehabilitate. Uh, getting to some of the, uh, uh, continuing with the details in the system, uh, what we're looking at here is a unit with uh, no setting block on one side, and on the other side, the setting block is jammed right up into the corner. So the rule of thumb is that the setting blocks go at the quarter points of the units. They should be at least four inches wide. You can upscale that depending on the size of the units, and they're there to properly support both lights, or all of the lights, I should say, of the glass. Uh, in this case, because it's no setting block on the one side, any water is just going to sit on that seal and very likely lead to premature failure of those vision units. Also blocking the drainage path on, on both sides. Uh, this is another setting block issue. It's, it's really hard to see in this picture, and I have another one coming up that becomes a little bit clearer. Uh, Surface one of the glass is uh, the, the top part. Surface two, we can see just a bit of a triangle above it, which is what's biting on the setting block. When we take those units out, what we found is that the outer light had started to sag down because they weren't being properly supported. This was showing itself in fogging on the units. So again, about a 10-year-old building, about 10% of the units had fogged at that point in time. Uh, they were also leaking a fair bit for, due to some other problems. Uh, we were there to solve the leaks and redo the detailing. The difficulty there was if we had have put those same vision units back in place with proper support on the setting blocks, it would have just moved back and that failure rate from 10% that we'd seen so far likely would have become a lot higher at that point in time. This is just another uh, bad example of a uh, corner block. It's set too high in the system, again, impeding drainage. And, and I wanted to show this one more just because the, the vision unit is in there so we can see where the water is supposed to come down the jams there and out through the sill. And that corner block being set too high acts as a, uh, as a dam in the system. Here's one of the examples where a very, very small detail has led to overall system malfunction, I guess is a good word for that. Uh, hard to see in this one, but that fastener that we're looking at there, and look at it with the pressure plate installed, is not compressing on the pressure plates at all. This is a dry, dry system, meaning it's a dry a gasket on the interior, gasket on your exterior seal and they do require proper compression around the entire perimeter of the unit to get your good seal. If you don't have compression, even on any part, and especially if it's at the corners, that's going to be vulnerable to leakage. What we're seeing here is the result of the screws or the fasteners bottoming out in the screw chase. So the screws were a little bit too long for the system and they would hit the bottom of the screw chase before they got proper compression on it. Uh, we've seen two full buildings like this in the past three years. Um, on one of them, the glass was seven eighths inch thick. Generally speaking, glass is one inch thick. So it could have been that the proper screws for the system were used, but because the glass was slightly undersized, the screws bottomed out. Uh, the other one, the glass was the right size, so they've either used incorrect screws or possibly the wrong gasket in some cases. Uh, again, a very small difference there, an eighth of an inch can make a lot of uh, performance impediment or, or impairment on the system. Uh, both of those buildings were leaking systemically throughout them. Uh, this was an interesting one. It was, a, uh, it was a prior retrofit that had been completed. And when they did the original retrofit, they transformed it from a dry interior, meaning gasket, to a wet interior, meaning glazing tape. Now, glazing tape is just a, it's a basically a butyl tape or a shim tape, it's called, with a, the shim or the cord running the longitudinal direction in the tape. Uh, the shim is meant or is there so it doesn't compress. Uh, if you have a glass squeezing on just a butyl tape, over time the butyl will all just squeeze out. So the shim keeps that, uh, keeps that gap consistent 
and keeps the butyl from all squeezing in. Uh, what we so that what we expected on this to see was they'd used a butyl tape instead of a shim tape. Very common, especially in residential windows. Uh, it's been done a lot in that area. Uh, what we found is that they had just converted it from dry to wet, and they hadn't filled the channel where the raceway on the or the uh, where the where the nib on the gasket is normally sitting. Uh, as a result, over time, the cord in the shim tape had just got compressed down into that gasket. At that point, it is acting like a butyl tape because your cord is gone and it had squeezed out. So we have glass on metal, a lot of leaking, which you can see evidence of there. Uh, this is just some good old shoddy detailing. Uh, the whole system also has racked. Uh, racking means that basically the top and the bottom have shifted parallel to one another. So instead of having rectangular openings, we now have parallelograms. Um, so that's a problem in of itself. It, it shows itself though in, in that the glass is touching the metal, which we can see in the, in the bottom right quadrant there. Uh, block drainage paths all over the place. And on the bottom left quadrant, and what we actually did find in some of these uh, situations, is that the glass was almost at the point where it was no longer in contact with the shoulder of the mullion. So you, with a captured system, you generally expect to see half inch bite on the shoulder. So I mean half an inch of your glass is in contact with the shoulder of your mullion on all four sides. Uh, what that one was is it was almost, so there was literally a hole in the glass that uh, we could see daylight through, uh, just a sliver of daylight on some of them. Uh, this was in a sloped glazing application where the system was retaining water and seals failed and over years the space between the lights of glass was actually filling up with water. Uh, so they had uh, various aquaculture uh, going on in their, in their skylight system. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of my favorites here, this is one we're working on currently. Um, uh, skylight system, slope glazing, again, very, very problematic in that it's leaking all over the system, so there doesn't, it's not just a localized leak, it's a systemic. Uh, once we got out there and removed, which is what we're seeing there, the, uh, the flashing, we learned that the entire skylight system drains in behind the roof membrane. So any water that gets in through your outer seal of your skylight system does drain down to the bottom quite well. Uh, most of the skylights actually detailed reasonably okay, but it drains underneath your roof membrane. So when we cut the roof membrane open there, which is what we're seeing, we had about two inches of standing water in there. Uh, the funny thing on this one is why I was kind of chuckling is they have re-roofed that twice in the past 10 years. Um, and they've done it exactly the same way. Different contractors, different people involved each time, and they keep making the same mistake again and again. So, uh, and we were finally out there to fix the skylight. And said, well, yeah, your skylight isn't perfect, but you guys really have a roofing problem here. Uh, another transition detail. Uh, this photo is of a parapet. Uh, we can see the curtain wall on the left, roof on the right. This is immediately after removing the parapet cap flashing. Uh, no other components have been removed from the system when this photo was taken. So you don't need to say too much about it other than uh, you know, there's obviously no membrane there, there's obviously no continuity of your air seal. Uh, if we look down that inside corner, that's the same case all through that area as well. Uh, the only thing keeping air and water out of that building was the parapet cap flashing and that bent piece of, of green flashing out at the face. Uh, so we are, again, looking for continuity of air seal, um, one of the more easy uh, diagnoses we had once we got that one opened up. And this is another fun transition detail. Uh, louver system at the top of about a 28-story building um, we can see we've got the uh, pressure plates removed at that point in time, the caps removed. And that louver was basically a face sealed system at, at that point in time. They had 
uh, evidence of a membrane underneath there. You can see it just on the uh, on the T angle there at the bottom. Uh, there was the membrane underneath the plywood and the louvers, but it was in no way tied into the curtain wall system. Uh, so we're, we should be seeing that memory come over the shoulder and be sealed to that so your air seal is continuous. Uh, surprisingly, it had performed reasonably well for quite a long period of time, but when it started to fail, it failed very rapidly. Uh, the, the, the face seals on it started to go, a little bit of water got in, swelled the plywood underneath there quite quickly, which really opened it up fast. So it went from no problem to a little problem to water is just pouring into that building every time it rains within the span of about six months on, a, on quite an old building. So it was, kind of, it was interesting to see. Uh, we were mainly there out for the curtain wall and uh, it was late in the season. This was out in Edmonton. Uh, so the temperatures are dropping quite rapidly and uh, sat with the architect and the owner and uh, unfortunately to fix that properly those louvers would have had to come out and, and redo the membrane and that was a very very difficult task given uh, the time of year and a few other things. Uh, so the team came up with a, a temporary solution uh, rather than just caulking it we tried to go back with a one two three tape uh, and caulking it uh, hoping to get a little bit more lifespan uh, out of that fix uh, is the tape would allow maybe a little bit more movement there. Um, what we didn't anticipate is the vultures that were on the building literally eating the one, two, three tape, which is what we came back next year, found it like this, where the, where the tape had been picked away around the perimeter of the building. Um, so that was a, 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 a sort of the lead into the environmental failures. Uh, birds got this one at that point in time. Um, this is another uh, environmental failure here or at least failure related to the environment. Uh, very well built curtain wall system, downtown Toronto, very, very few leaks, 30 plus years into its life, very few sealed unit replacements. So it has been working very well, but the rate had started to increase noticeably by the building operations. They, they noticed an increase in the rate. Uh, called us out to do an investigation, trying to find out why. Uh, when we started opening localized areas, we found a lot of accumulation just of dirt within the system. So that's dirt that's got under the building, washed in and not exited, and it was starting to block the drainage path. So that system was starting to retain the water within it, which was starting to cause the leaks and the failed sealed units that we were seeing. And again, environmental, this is just a little bit of aquaculture going on in the drainage gutter there on a sloped drain system or sloped, uh, uh, sloped vision system. Now moving on to the structural realm. Uh, it can be simple as uh, incorrect or incompatible fasteners, incompatible materials used. Uh, we can see here when we take those uh, fasteners out that there's been significant deterioration in the, uh, in the amount of them uh, or in the fasteners. Uh, curtain wall anchors are something we look at uh, regularly. Uh, this particular anchor system was on a retrofit. We were uh, originally going to be relying on the original existing anchors. What we found very quickly when we looked at them uh, the slots that we're seeing on the top of the photo are into the underside of the slab. So the slots are in and out of the building to allow for adjustment. What we're seeing is that connection isn't frozen in any way. Uh, so it was relying solely on the friction between the washer and the plate to keep that curtain wall on the building. So you can quickly look at that and say that connection is inadequate. When we actually did the full structural engineering, we found that the whole anchor isn't adequate. Uh, what's interesting though, it had been there for 45 years and they had zero problems with it. So it, it's one example of something where on paper it doesn't work. In the field, did they get lucky? Did uh, things work out for them? Yeah, I mean, they didn't have any problems with it. Having said that, once you know about it, you are otherwise retrofitting. It, it did lead to the necessity of changing all of the anchors. Another structural failure here, this is a, a one level curtain wall system around the entrance to a parking garage. Really, really big units in that one. They're about eight feet by 10 feet, uh, half inch glazing. Uh, one of them weighs upwards of 600 pounds, so quite a lot of mass to them. Uh, we can see that gap that runs the entire length there 
Um, and that gap had been there for quite a while and no one had ever really asked why. Until one day they came in and found that three of those units had just fell out of the system. And what they quickly saw is that uh, once those units were out, you could see the anchors there. That is actually one of the anchors that was in decent shape when we found it. Decent being a totally relative term in this case. Uh, some of them were literally piles of rust when we looked at them. Uh, the system wasn't drained properly at the sill. Water got in. So water getting in is, I guess you'd call that the root cause. Having said that, the incorrect material was used for those anchors. And then compounding that, we have an aluminum sill sitting on a steel anchor. So the galvanic reaction there is going to accelerate the deterioration when any water gets in. So a whole lot of stuff happening here on this one. Um, once again, it was a, one where we came out, okay, we got to fix the anchors. That was the specified solution that we bid on. Uh, we did our investigation and said, why are there little nicks out of the top of the glass every six inches or so? So uh, looked at the system in a little bit more detail. And when they had constructed it, they didn't allow for deflection of the roof beams. So we had this condition at the sill. We had the roof literally pushing down on the head of the glass, and eventually they just started popping out of the, uh, out of the building. Um, I bring that up to talk, er, and, and just to, to reiterate the point that sometimes when we see a very obvious problem, we want to rush out and fix it and make everything better. And especially when you see something this bad, I guess, keep looking. Uh, because the first problem you see, yeah, it's going to contribute to it, but you should expect to see more issues when you see this type of detailing. And, and we've been burned on that. Um, I, I, one skylight job that, that we did, uh, we had a good specification that was given to us by the, the consultant. We looked at it, we reviewed it, said, yep, that looks like a good spec. We went out, we did everything uh, that was asked. Uh, we flood tested it in, and the whole darn thing still leaked. And we're like, oh crap, we just missed something that the consultant missed it, we missed it, and we didn't do the testing early enough in the process to catch it. And that was a very, very expensive lesson to learn. Um, so keep looking, keep testing is the, uh, is the best advice uh, we, we can give. Uh, this is also slope glazing, uh, not that that's as relevant in this case. And we can see that the unit there is fractured, so it is tempered glass, which is good. Um, and, and what had happened in this case is they had retrofit that part of the building, so about 300 units overall. Uh, we were coming in to do a secondary phase of the retrofit. Uh, bronze glass, uh, very commonly available, not difficult to match. Uh, we were out doing our mock-ups put the glass in and it was immediately adjacent to this area and it didn't match just right. And we couldn't figure it out so finally we, we flipped the glass around just to see if they had put the sticker on the wrong side. When you get a new sealed unit it has a sticker on it says glaze this side in. So yeah maybe they just threw it on the wrong side it was just a mock-up unit and everything matches perfectly. So like okay great problem solved stickers on the wrong side. Uh, and we started looking a little bit closer at the existing glass and found that the reflective coating that was supposed to be on surface two was actually on surface three. So the contractor that had done the previous repairs had installed all of the glass backwards. Now the funny thing on that was is that they were asked to. Um, the consultant in this case thought that the glass matched the existing that they weren't changing better when they installed it backwards. So they, they actually asked us to do the same thing on the new one. I said, no, we really don't want to do that. We'll, we'll install ours uh, frontwards. And uh, um, we actually had to get a letter from our, our, our manufacturer stating why it is not a good idea to put in a, a sealed unit with the reflective coating on Surface 3. Now, they were tempered, so that is probably okay in this case. If they were annealed, certainly that would be a much higher risk, but tempering, is the kind of, uh, is what you do when you have potential for heat buildup uh, in glass, uh, like in a differential shaded area there. Um, so we don't know exactly why that one fractured. Uh, my thoughts are is it could have been because it's backwards, because we have differential shading on a south facing wall on a nice cold day, 
the conditions were absolutely perfect for it to uh, fracture due to the, to the heat buildup within the glass. It could have just been a nickel sulfide inclusion on that one as well, which can also cause tempered glass to spontaneously break. But uh, it, it is certainly a possibility that it was because of the uh, uh, incorrect installation. Uh, moving on to structural. Uh, this is a sample of one of the panels that came off the building where the three went missing. Uh, so what we did there, we, we came up uh, with the idea of taking three panels from the bottom of the system, moving them up to the top, and then temporarily patching the bottom so we could get stuff manufactured and come back there where access would be easier at a later date. Uh, while we were doing this, we were obviously going out and looking at the system and trying to figure out why it had failed in the first place. Uh, so that's a stacked system. It's installed from bottom to top, and all the panels interact with each other. So it's actually quite difficult. Without doing some sort of destructive removal, uh, they have to be removed in the opposite order in which they were installed. Uh, basics of the system, there's a horizontal rib across the head that's attached on with one eighth inch welded studs. Excuse me. Uh, there's retainer channels and jams, bayonet retainers at the sill. So the sill of the panel above interacts with the horizontal rib of the panel below it to keep it retained. Uh, it's positively fastened onto the building through shelf brackets on the horizontal rib. So basically it's fastened at the head and it's allowed to float, expand and contract on the other three sides. What we found uh, is just really, really poor overall detailing in a lot of uh, the areas. This is one of the shelf brackets. As we can see, there's only one fastener between the rib and the shelf bracket. Often there was only one between the shelf bracket and the building structure. And in a lot of those cases, they were very loose. You could walk up to them without any kind of mechanical advantage and just pull the fasteners off. So that connection had really loosened. There wasn't a lot of interaction there between the two members. Uh, this was the condition we found a lot of the fasteners in. So it was right up against the edge. It had basically ruptured at that point in time. Uh, we saw others where there was five or six holes drilled where we suspect when they were installing it, the guys kept trying to put the fastener in and missing, so they kept moving the hole around. Uh, so we looked like some that looked like literally like a sieve there with all the holes in them. Uh, other things we can see, uh, the evidence of staining around those washers. A lot of the components on the system were loose. You could grab that horizontal rib and easily move it up and down. So the components were starting to loosen. A lot of the studs were starting to break off. Uh, we found ones that had uh, three of the six studs holding that rib on were sheared off when we took the panels off the wall. And these were the good panels down at the bottom. So in terms of why retrofits are important, obviously we've seen the risk management on some of the structural, that's just what we talked about. Uh, other than that though, there's a lot of sealed units on buildings that are coming due. 50% uh, of the commercial building stock in Canada is over 20, 20 years old. Uh, and all of those buildings at some point will need some level of remediation. Not saying necessarily full retrofit, but they'll need some level of remediation. Uh, energy efficiency is starting to drive these, much more so. Uh, Ten years ago when we got involved, it was sort of a, a very low level consideration. Now we're seeing it's not necessarily number one, but clients are definitely very aware and tenants are becoming very aware of the energy. Uh, they, they don't want to be uh, associated with a building uh, that is very leaky, is very poor thermal performance. So we're starting to see the, uh, you know, the displays in the lobbies on how much energy is getting saved. And that's purely done from the tenant's perspective. <coughs> Finally, it's a really, really good opportunity to upgrade and modernize the building's appearance. Uh, the core reason you're often going out there is to fix technical problems. And, and it's usually possible to just fix the technical problem and make the building look the same. But it's often not a lot more money to go out and fix the technical problem and make the building look really good or a lot newer at the same time. And that's really important that uh, everyone in, uh, on the teams understand that and, and work around or, or, or make sure the client is aware of that 
and design the retrofit appropriately. Because a lot of the times you can make a building look really good without a lot of extra cost while you're there fixing the uh, technical problem anyways. And so I don't go into a lot of detail on any of these. Again, feel free if I have any questions here. Just talk a little bit about some of the different methods of retrofitting these buildings. Um, this is City Center Place out in Edmonton. Uh, we see the before on the left, the after is on the right, and the rendering is in the middle. Uh, the most basic means of going out and retrofitting a building is you strip it down, you fix what's there in terms of your seals, so you look at the back pan areas, you look at your expansion joints, your parapets, your corners, and redetail the system and put the glass back on. In this case, it was driven largely by the number of failed sealed units, which I mentioned before, but they were also having a lot of leak problems, so there's a lot of work in those areas that I mentioned to do while we were out there. Uh, the renderings help to provide the owner with a good visualization of what the building can look like. Uh, this was interesting in that it was tendered just as a straight up glass replacement with the redetailing. Uh, there's no work scheduled up for the parapet. Uh, we included the rendering with our submission and said, hey, you know what, for an extra uh, about 1% of your project budget, uh, you can make the building pop a little bit more. Uh, so we included just some differences in the snap caps and, and a coating in the parapet, which was really, uh, most of that work was being done anyways. Uh, in terms of the detailing, just showing some of the things you might come across, uh, that's redoing an expansion joint there and uh, putting a membrane on to allow for a little bit of movement. A lot of it said is in the back pan areas there. We had to notch all of the, uh, the lips of the back pans. They weren't draining prior. Uh, that lip was continuous along the front face, so any water that got into the back pan area was just retained there. Uh, redoing all of your plastics, uh, that's fairly typical. These uh, thermal breaks, we literally had to cut them out of the old ones. They were really, really caked in there with some old mono caulking, so very hard. You had to get in there and chisel them out. <coughs> So you're typically looking at doing all new plastics in this type of retrofit. Yep. If you do something like that, you're taking all the glass off as well. Like, people still occupy the building while you do this? Everything that we do, the buildings remain fully occupied, yes. Yeah. So. Generally what we'll do, we'll go out uh, during the days, we'll strip the building, uh, take spandrels off, work on spandrel repairs, come 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, uh, or weekends, depending. This was Edmonton, so we did a lot of it on weekends. We'd come out and do the vision glass replacements. So we try and schedule our retrofits so that it minimizes the tenant disruption. And, uh, you know, if we have an empty building, great. Uh, or if you have an empty floor in a building, that's awesome for us. But it's not what's expected. Um, so I, I'd say... For vision glass, certainly, we're doing that after hours. Rarely does an owner want to ask a tenant to vacate the space so we can come in and change the sealed units. Like, you guys figure it out when I'm not here. Uh, these are a couple reclads. Um, so there, the, the one extreme is the system is really okay. The base system is there and can be fixed. The other extreme is the base system has no redeeming value whatsoever, so get rid of the whole thing. And that's what we're looking at on these two. Uh, one was just a one-level curtain wall around a courthouse. Uh, the other was a, quite an interesting one. It's a four-story atrium connecting four different buildings that were built at four different times. Two of them are historic designated. So there's a lot going on in that retrofit. Um, and there you do run into a lot more challenges in terms of we are now cutting a real hole in the wall. How do we protect the inside? Uh, Coburg on the left there, we were able to design the system so that whatever we opened up in a day could be closed back up that day and we'd sort of leapfrog along the building. Uh, whereas uh, at Sun Life there, we had to protect everything in the atrium because the atrium actually stayed active during our, uh, during our retrofit. Uh, when you're doing this type, you're often going with a stick-built system uh, on site, so you have to be aware of all the uh, details that are not going to get to be done in the shop like you would see on a unitized. Most of the new tower work you're seeing now is unitized systems. The vast majority of the detailing is done in the shop 
in the base or on the, with the understanding that it should be able to be done to a higher degree of quality there as compared to doing it in the field. This is just the interior there showing uh, some of that overhead protection. So the, the atrium remained fully active during construction, uh, tarped out the outside. We had to do it unfortunately during the winter so that uh, uh, one another degree of difficulty added in there. Uh, and then we have the ones that are sign of in the middle. So we went from can reuse the system to you got to get rid of it to we have a system there and there's some redeeming qualities to it but it, it can't be made to what I guess I would classify as a good system just with redetailing. So at 400 University, this was the video I played up at the start, uh, we've actually designed a, a custom curtain wall that is getting overclad on top of the existing system, again while the building remains fully occupied. Uh, so there's unitized frames going on, uh, the building gets fully glazed from the exterior, so we put our new frames on, we glaze them, capture them, and only then do we go inside and remove the old pane of vision glass. So it's really neat in that we're doing a full reclad on a building without actually ever having the inside exposed to the outside. Uh, at the end, then, we're also going in and overcladding the, uh, the curtain wall on the inside. And well, so you, the, the logical question is, well, why couldn't you just make this system work? Uh, a, it wasn't really a curtain wall. It was kind of wanted to be sort of a little bit of a curtain wall, at least in the spandrel areas. Uh, they were probably designed to be vented and drained, but really from the time of construction, there were so many flaws in the construction detailing that that never happened. Uh, so as a result, over the years, the spandrels had become a face-sealed system. They'd gone out on the exterior, face-sealed everything. And the vision areas were never meant to be drained. They were always an interior glazed system, single glazing as well. Uh, so you could never... Um, you can never convert that to a truly vented drain system just by redetailing. Uh, having said that, it did serve some purposes. There's a decent structure there. Uh, we'd hoped to be able to reuse the uh, anchors. Turned out we didn't uh, on, on this one. Uh, but there were some redeeming qualities about the existing system from a structural standpoint and also, very, very importantly, as the temporary weather barrier while we're doing the new construction. Um, it was performing the same way during construction it was before, so we were very comfortable with, the, with that approach in that uh, if you are opening up a hole in the wall, you have a lot of considerations to worry about. How do you keep the inside protected? Uh, how do you keep the inside heated, especially if a program like this is going to occur over the winter months or when it gets cold? Uh, so it was a really nice hybrid approach. It also lent itself to a high degree of customization on the new system so that you could design and build a system that is, is really specifically designed for the building in question. So you're not trying to take something and, and make it work. It's you have a clean slate. What's the best system for this particular application? And, and go out and get the dies cut and, and, the, and the aluminum extruded and whatnot. So it, it does allow for a higher degree of quality using this type of approach on the right building. And, and that is definitely not every building. It's just some more of the, uh, the, the back pan areas. We can see it was just a sheet metal back pan and the vertical member came down. That should be sealed at that intersection between the vertical member and the sheet metal back pan on the far right. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we just couldn't uh, really make good in the field. That's the new system going on. I mentioned it's unitized. Uh, we were able to incorporate some of the custom things. That little hook that we're seeing on the is actually part of our extrusion. And once we remove a feature strip from the outside, we're actually hooking our new frames on over top of the existing frame. That's not really structural. It, 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 kind of as a structural backup. It's not relied on in our structural calculations, but it was just a really handy thing to use to level our system, uh, to be able to have a bit of a safety when the guys are installing it. A number of things there that, uh, again, when you're going custom, you can incorporate that type of uh, detail. And that's the after. So we can see the old vision stops get removed from the inside, the old glass gets removed, and everything else is overclad. 
So the old frame still exists underneath that cladding that we're looking at there. So again, from both the outside and the inside, brand new curtain wall to anyone who's looking at it with the, uh, without the knowledge of actually when it, what, what, what went into that system. And there's the after from the exterior. Uh, do, is there any questions at this point? I can talk about City Hall for a few minutes or uh, take a few questions. Sure. Do you have any experience with uh, hard-on glass areas? Or has there been any evidence? It's not my area of expertise. Um, I'll say we've done some of our projects. We've done testing on the sealed units coming from the manufacturer to see what percent of are gone in, and we have seen some fail. Um, and the manufacturers, well, yeah, it's an average and whatnot. And then the testing methods aren't perfect, so we have to be aware of that too. When we've done our thermal modeling, and City Hall was one where we did an awful lot of thermal modeling, on the basis of that modeling only, nothing else experienced, the argon didn't make that big of a difference anyways. <laughs> um, it, it's nice, but it's like 0.1 percent, or I'm, I'm not sure exactly on that. But it's a, in terms of the overall system performance, it's not a big deal, at least on what we showed in the modeling there. And then maybe there are times when it is, but uh, that's I said not really my area. Stainless is ideal. Um, sometimes we'll, uh, stainless is ideal, and then you look at what's practical. Um, 400 University is a good example where we'd love to use stainless on all of the fasteners, but they had to be self drillers, self tappers. Uh, you start doing that with stainless and they start breaking. Um, uh, they're a coated one in that case for the, for the uh, pressure plates. Yeah. They're okay. They're okay. We did a lot of testing on that. Um, it was something we had a lot of concern over. And it's usually something on these custom ones, you'll spend a lot of time going over sealant compatibility, uh, fastener compatibility, what's the right fastener to use where, and making sure that everything gets spec'd out. Because uh, if you leave one of those little details out, you, know, you don't know what the consequences are. Probably it's not a big deal, but uh, uh, you gotta be really careful there. Okay, talk a little bit, I got a little bit more time, so I'll talk a little bit about Toronto City Hall. Uh, this was a uh, design build. Uh, we got involved in the project in around 2008, and Toronto Hydro Energy Services had been allocated a pool of money to do energy efficiency upgrades on Toronto City Hall. Uh, one of the main ones they had identified was the window system. Uh, it was a single glaze system, uh, leaking lots, uh, but the biggest factor for them was single glaze. So they wanted to go to a double glaze system. Uh, built in 19, early 1960s, uh, it was the result of an international uh, architectural competition won by a Finnish architect named Vilo Ravel. And City Hall is now a designated heritage building. It was listed in the late 70s, I think it was designated in around 91. So, that's an example of the zipper gasket system. And what a zipper gasket is, uh, I have a piece, this is from City Hall in my hand. It goes over the frame where my fingers are slotted in here. There's a zipper or a lock strip, they're often referred to as a lock strip gasket. It gets pulled back. This should theoretically peel back. The glass would go in here and the lock strip gets pushed back into place. So this system, they tend to perform okay thermally because this is a non-conductive uh, material. They tend to fall down on the air and water penetration. They rely on the lip pressure of the gasket to the glass to keep air and water out. Uh, if I was to pass this around, this is more like a billy club than a neoprene gasket at this point in time. They would be about interchangeable. Very, very hard. It's been exposed to UV for 50 years and it, 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 at this point, lost most of its elasticity. So once that shrinks back a little bit, water's free to get in at the corners. Of also note on this slide, there's a, there's a trough that extends around all four sides of the glass. 
and that's key to some of our design there. The only difference was that the depth of the trough changed on each of the head sill and jams. So we originally looked at six different systems for City Hall. Uh, they were an aluminum frame system, a stainless steel frame system, and a zipper gasket system, each glazed from either the interior or the exterior. Evaluated them on the criteria that we're looking at there. Heritage played a very, very large role in our evaluation. Um, the ideal is don't change anything. Um, moving on from that, they said, okay, what can we measure from a heritage perspective? Uh, so respect of building materials. Uh, that's why the stainless frames were considered. There's a lot of stainless steel on City Hall. Um, daylight opening was something that they were concerned of. We knew that there was likely to be some loss of DLO. We wanted to keep that loss to a minimum. Uh, reversibility was key for heritage. Anything that we put into the building, if heritage decided at some later date that they wanted to, we had to be able to go and take that back out of the building and revert to the existing or the original system. So those were all very important factors for us. What it really meant is that we couldn't take out anything other than the existing glazing and the existing zipper gasket. Everything else had to stay in place and we had to work around it. I uh, did wind tunnel testing. That's down at the uh, University of Western Ontario's wind tunnel lab. City Hall is in the middle. Wanted to have a very good handle on what type of design criteria we should be using for it. Uh, as a result of that wind tunnel testing, I uh, found very, very high loads, especially up at the upper corners on the towers. Uh, and uh, had we gone to the building code, looked at a regular shape building of similar height in a similar location, the loads we generated out of this were about double, and in some cases slightly more than double. So very high loading criteria on the system. The benefit of that is we were able to eliminate the zipper gasket from consideration on the structural concern basis. They were high loads, they probably could have worked, but uh, our engineer on that, who is Jupiter Engineering, uh, just didn't feel confident in that. Uh, so we were able to go primarily uh, focus on the aluminum frame design, and that's what we're looking at there. And what I have in my hand here is just a, a snapshot of it. Structural components there in red, so we used extruded aluminum tubes to fill in the gaps or that perimeter trough around each side of the window and give us a good solid base to install the new frames on. New frame is from here on up and very, very low profile frame. If we were to compare that to a, just a conventional curtain wall thing, there's a couple we'd notice. One, this is very low profile. Obviously, this is curtain wall, not window, so you can get smaller window frames, certainly. Uh, but there's a lot of material in this to meet the high loading criteria that we had. If you were to compare unit weight of these two extrusions, they're about the same length, they weigh about the same. Uh, so a lot of weight into a little bit of an area to make that uh, structural part of the system work. Uh, gaskets in green there. Uh, Again, everything on this one is custom, just like 400 University, designed for uh, the particular system there. Uh, we used a blue skin underneath the channels. That was meant to self-seal as we fastened into that place, or into that space. Theoretically, again, it should be interior airspace underneath there, but it wasn't part of our scope, so we assumed that it was not interior airspace, just in case they were getting leakage in the spandrel areas. Uh, architectural components on the inside we used an extruded uh, aluminum shape to hide the glazing leg also from a from an architectural standpoint to not mimic but uh, sort of be inspired by I think is the architectural term that we would use by the zipper gasket so a black band around the window surrounded by stainless steel uh, they used Rubber, we use metal to get that banded look, which is what we took uh, uh, Ravel's vision to be on that. And then clad the remainder of the inside with stainless steel. On the outside, very low profile, narrow snap cap and pressure plate. Again, we wanted to keep it as narrow as possible so that the width was as close as we could get to the existing zipper gasket 
Uh, we're a little bit wider, but not a lot. Uh, on this one, if you would have stood at the podium when we had our mock-ups on the eighth floor, you really couldn't tell the frames apart from the exterior. The only thing that read was the color of the glass. That just shows the overlay. So you can see we lost some daylight opening. Uh, we estimate we would have lost about an extra half to three quarter of an inch on each side had we gone with an off-the-shelf system on this. And Heritage wouldn't have gone for that. Uh, some of the testing we did, we built full-scale uh, replicas of the existing framing system, brought them into our shop, uh, used them for a design purpose so we could make design revisions and see how they'd work on the existing frame, used them for training of the crews as they would come in. We'd bring them in there and say, this is the frame that we have to install, these are the conditions we have to install it in, and these are the steps that we're going to follow. Again, because it's custom, you can't rely on the glazers saying, well, we've done this a thousand times. No, they haven't done it once, really, in this application. Also did it for the thermal and uh, air and water testing. And then I would on site. Uh, again, all the work was done in the evenings. We'd come in at five o'clock, uh, remove the old windows. Our new windows were pre-glazed, so they'd go right into the openings. And we could do anywhere up to around 12 to 15 windows a shift. And by the next day, they'd come back and their whole uh, workspace was, was back to normal. And that's uh, John, our engineer on it, looking at the inspection. We used uh, some custom cheaters there, which we're seeing in blue. I just had those plastics uh, fabricated so that we could index the new windows properly. It was really important uh, to get them in the right vertical plane so that when we put the pressure plates on, we were getting proper gasket compression. So that was uh, the way of doing that. That's the cheater. Uh, testing, did it in the lab as well as uh, on site there. Uh, we wanted to repeat that. We did about 12 tests throughout, so not just one at the start. And finally, the before and after. Shows a bit of the progression. The, uh, the ones on the left are finished, and the ones on the right are under construction. The ones on the second drop from the left are uh, the vision glasses in, and we're just capturing them. And so those benefits, uh, those were projected prior to our involvement. Um, the one that I can say, they've gone from 50 environmental-related complaints per week down to about three to four on the East Tower after, our, or after the project there. So really, really measurable impact on the, on the tenant's comfort in there. And at that, again, I want to really thank everyone for coming. Appreciate that. And uh, if anyone does have any questions, feel free or see me after.